I thought um, I'd kick off the presentation with a little bit of history. Uh, I'm a fan of history, as I think the past is a predictor for the future. So I could start arbitrarily far back, but uh, I'll start in a, what really was a stunning period uh, for me, looking, looking back. I wasn't there for it, but still looking back. Between uh, 1968 and, let's say, about 1973, 1974, where we had the uh, birth of modern computing. I mean, the number of simultaneous breakthroughs across different fields at one time, really amazing. Um, this community knows about the Intel 4004, the first microprocessor. Uh, Moore's Law was christened and has uh, propelled us for decades since. But also at that time, we had uh, the invention of Unix, uh, the invention of really the internet, TCP IP, Ethernet, the C programming language, relational databases, uh, object-oriented programming, the graphical user interface, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and this was, I think, the birth of modern computing, and we built on it for decades. Um, next point, though, that I'll point to, which um, I think this moment reminds me of, is about 1993, uh, where NCSA Mosaic first became available, the first graphical user interface that, uh, while the internet, of course, had been around for, let's say, 25 years prior to that, it really was the start of something big in terms of transforming how we uh, interact with technology. We as a society, we as a community. Uh, in the intervening 30 years, since 1993, uh, really the world has changed dramatically. Uh, today, we have the totality of human knowledge available to us at our fingertips, essentially. A uh, very, very different world uh, with uh, essentially how we have brought most of human knowledge online, accessible via networking, cellular technology, and more. Uh, this moment in 2023, uh, to me, feels like that time, which I do remember 30 years ago, where we were on the precipice for something transformational. Uh, I do think we're seeing these glimpses of the future with generative AI, and the imagination is starting to run with respect to what the next, let's say, five, 10 years uh, is going to look like. Uh, my sense is that. Uh, the transformation uh, that we're going to see is going to be significant and that uh, we can't actually imagine what it's going to look like right at this moment. Uh, just as with 1993, one couldn't really predict what the world was going to look like by, say, 2003. I think that these next 10 years are going to be uh, incredibly exciting, actually, and a great time to be doing work in uh, systems, a great time to be doing work in uh, computer architecture. So for me, this is just the beginning in that uh, uh, while we're seeing the early stages um, of what uh, generative AI can do, we're having similar advances in multimodal um, generation of text, images, audio, and video. And I do think that we're on the path. There's going to be a lot of risk. There's going to be a lot of challenges to artificial general intelligence. So we talk about generative AI, GAI. But AGI, I think, is the prize that many in the community are going after. And of course, what perhaps many in this community are uh, working to enable uh, autonomous agents with AGI that can learn and perform skills exceeding that of most people. It's a scary and exciting time. Uh, I view it as an opportunity to continue to uh, multiply and enhance human creativity. And that's, I think, what we're uh, all moving toward. So uh, just as with uh, prior technologies, some transformative ones, I think it's fair to say that the internet and the ubiquitous uh, uh, deployment of the internet has changed how we interact with technology, AGI will similarly transform how we interact with technology and transform uh, society, what we expect on a day-to-day -day basis. Interestingly, the infrastructure that powers responsible AGI requires similar transformation. One, I want to underscore this word responsible. I think that we've, uh, as a community, uh, as a technical community, learned some lessons from the deployment of technology over the past, let's say, five decades. And I hope that we carry those lessons forward. Uh, AGI will disrupt. It has the power to disrupt positively, but also negatively. And so I think that we need to think about the technical requirements for ensuring that the technology is deployed in a responsible way from the ground up. Just as with reliability, just as with security, just as with privacy, it's very hard to retrofit these requirements onto an existing technology. You want to start with responsibility, security, privacy, reliability as day one, day zero requirements for the technology. So 
we're in a time now in 2023 where the infrastructure, the work of this community, that's going to power responsible AGI has to transform. In other words, business as usual, the lessons that we've uh, gained, the hard won lessons that we've gained over the past decades actually are no longer going to apply. And um, what will probably be difficult, but also really exciting is we're going to have to rethink how we've gone about designing systems, building them and scaling them in the years ahead. So very, very briefly, uh, Gen AI is already dramatically changing the landscape in a very short amount of time. Uh, maybe on approximately a year, we're seeing um, productivity boosts across many industries. I won't go through the list, but uh, the two that I'm perhaps most excited about personally is uh, medicine and education. I do see a world where we can have a teacher for every learner and a doctor for every patient. And if I look back on my own experience, um, certainly as a professor, um, teaching and scaling teaching and scaling bringing education to people is really, really challenging. I think that uh, done right, AGI, responsible AGI, has the potential to really bring knowledge at scale to the planet. And similarly for medicine, just the uh, availability of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge, many, many scalability, accuracy, and otherwise challenges here that uh, I hope we can take on in the years ahead. This move to generative AI uh, is actually coming at a very interesting time where we are, again, uh, turning to the notion of why the infrastructure must change. I think we're facing fundamentally new requirements uh, that are shifting how we think about technology. And I refer to these as the four S's. Uh, the first S is societal infrastructure. So since, let's say, 1993, early days of the internet revolution, uh, we've seen availability improve by a factor of 10 to 100. So I recall studies in the late 90s that said a typical internet path had availability of 98 to 99%. You think 98 to 99%, that's not so bad. On the other hand, if you multiply it out, that's somewhere around a week of downtime a year. Right? Societal infrastructure cannot have a week of uh, downtime a year. Maybe we've improved that by a factor of 10 to 100, which is pretty stunning. But actually, that's not enough. We probably have at least another factor of 10 to 100 uh, to go in truly making this infrastructure reliable at the level that it needs to be. Uh, the second S is security. Uh, the value of the data that is now online is uh, growing tremendously. There are increasing threats, both internal and external, with well-funded attackers. In other words, today, it's uh, not the same as it was, uh, let's say, 30 years ago. I remember when the first internet worm actually um, uh, whatever was launched in 1993, uh, excuse me, 1989, I'm mapping it to my own uh, undergraduate experience, and one-third of the internet went down. It was a uh, page four article about one inch, right, in the, the local paper. Uh, yeah, some, some people were inconvenienced, one-third of the internet went down, no problem. Um, it was written by a 19-year-old at Cornell University. Uh, I, won't, I won't name him, but he's actually a rather famous professor today. Uh, attackers these days are not hobbyists at home. They're well-funded. Um, they're carrying out these attacks continuously with the perspective of um, uh, being able to gain access to data over a multi-year, even multi-decade uh, period. So building our infrastructure to uh, support the privacy and the sanctity of our data is just going to be super important moving forward. Third S is uh, sustainable. Uh, this is something, again, that uh, we're looking at it today. Uh, global computation consumes perhaps to 3% of global power. A substantial number, um, but one that's growing uh, relatively quickly. So again, we have to think about how we design our infrastructure from the ground up. I'm pleased that there's a lot of work, including here, in terms of thinking about how we consider energy and power as first class resources. Uh, but we also have to think about the carbon emissions of the uh, power that we consume and the power that goes into building our infrastructure. And so this says that moving forward, we can't think about just maximum scale, but how we deploy, manage, and operate our infrastructure. And finally, sovereignty, the fourth S. Uh, uh, interestingly, the last, let's say, two decades with cloud computing has uh, really been around uh, designs focusing on central control. I think we're seeing a sea change, a 
secular sea change back toward decentralized for data residency or provenance, right? And this is actually going to have, again, substantial implications for our infrastructure. So back to a bit of a history lesson in terms of uh, how we have to think about our infrastructure moving forward. This is an article which I do remember um, seeing in 1991 in the New York Times talking about the attack of the killer micros. And uh, even back then, I think this community uh, might, might have some remembrance of this as well. Uh, computing was delivered by uh, what I and others call scale-up computing. Right? You built ever larger computers uh, that were ever more powerful with a focus on supporting single-threaded code, essentially, that could run really, really fast. And every year, every two years, powered by Moore's Law, it would just run faster. No recompilation needed, no architectural changes needed. 32 years ago, people were thinking of new paradigms for organizing computing. Uh, what about clusters of workstations, clusters of com commodity compute? It uh, took about 10 years, and it took the internet revolution, but let's say 10 years later, around 2001, 2002, 2003, what was viewed as a fringe idea, what was viewed by many in the community uh, as a um, not good idea, in fact, became the norm for how internet scale services were built and deployed. So over these past 20 years, uh, we've leveraged as a community, commodity storage, compute, and networking hardware that leveraged this uh, curve that we were on, where we could look at doubling in performance for fixed costs every couple of years. Incredible. So we went from scale up computing to scale out computing. And you could take a cluster, uh, of commodity PCs, workstations, interconnect them with commodity Ethernet, run open source Linux on them, and organize them as essentially a supercomputer that doubled in capability every couple of years. Uh, doubled in the amount of data that it could store, doubled in the amount of data that it could process, doubled in the number of queries per second that it could deliver across the planet for fixed costs. And you take these doublings every couple of years uh, over a 20-year period, and with simple math, that's a factor of 1,000. Amazing. Right? Over the past 20 years, this new paradigm that's set in, this paradigm that I would argue many of us now take for granted around cluster-based scale-out computing, has powered a factor of 1,000 improvement in capability. We can do 1,000 times more for the same cost today than we could 20 years ago. And this has been what's powered uh, the ability to have the totality of human knowledge at your fingertips. And something that has uh, transformed society in very, very interesting ways. Uh, software was built around this paradigm, uh, loose coupling, right? This was a fundamental shift from tightly coupled scale up uh, computing that we had before. And in these 20 years, we've uh, been able to reimagine what was possible year after year after year. We scaled these clusters uh, to warehouse scale computers. Uh, we built multiple of them in single regions with hundreds of megawatts, perhaps even gigawatts of compute capacity in individual regions. Uh, we scaled them out across the planet so that again now uh, this compute infrastructure across many different providers is available to the um, vast majority of people across the planet. I'll take a Google-centric view, but uh, similar breakthroughs uh, took place at many places. The software architecture mirrored the hardware architecture. Right? As we built commodity scale out cluster-based infrastructure, uh, the software followed suit. Uh, I remember uh, myself, um, I, I can say it now, I was on the um, SOSP program committee in 2003 when the GFS paper, the Google File System paper was submitted. I wasn't at Google at the time. And here was this paper that said we were going to take 20,000 disks and put them under a single centralized controller as the basis for a file system the program committee was shocked. This, is, this was not a good idea. It was too simple. You had to build a peer-to-peer, -peer, fully decentralized system to manage your uh, scale-out compute, of course, and your scale-out storage. Uh, we we um, fortunately, though I'll say it was controversial, accepted the paper. And this was the first of many that showed how you could scale out across the cluster with commodity software really under centralized control. Uh, MapReduce followed showing how you could uh, do analytics at the scale of tens, tens of thousands of servers. Big table uh, that uh, signaled the um, NoSQL revolution. 
Borg showed how to do scheduling and admission control, resource allocation uh, across, again, tens of thousands of servers, scaling out from there. Uh, Spanner file system, and then, uh, interestingly, TensorFlow, which was the first uh, neural network uh, distributed learning infrastructure, also took a centralized view for how you would manage the infrastructure under software, really targeting CPUs at the time. So this paradigm of centralized control, loosely coupled, followed the cluster architecture from the past 20 years. So really, really exciting. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the trends that have powered the past 20 years are slowing and stopping. So this is uh, cartoon versions of real data. Uh, this is not a Google-specific view. It's an industry-wide view. So what we're seeing is, uh, and again, what you all are seeing, better than anybody, is plateaus in curves that we previously took for granted. We thought, well, it was, it's been going great for so long, it has to continue. Uh, unfortunately not. So what used to be, let's say, 40% year-over-year improvement in CPU performance for fixed cost, by right, doubling every two years, is now maybe a couple, 3% for general purpose compute. DRAM dollars per byte, right? you used to get twice the DRAM for the same dollars. Now, more or less flat, and perhaps even trending uh, up. In other words, the cost of DRAM per byte is slowly trending up because of the reliability requirements for making sure that, of course, DRAM uh, serves up what's uh, read, uh, written. This dollars per byte, exact same trends. And again, you all know this uh, much better than me. Uh, power efficiency has flattened out as well. So uh, we cannot continue to scale our infrastructure in the same way that we did. And uh, what's really powered the factor of 1,000 over the past 20 years isn't going to power whatever needs to come next. This is all happening at a time where, at least in my study of history, the demand for compute and data growth is truly unprecedented. I've never seen anything like this. Uh, this is one graph that shows the demand for compute. And really, one way to look at this is actually the demand for compute right now in data is infinite. Like, if we could do 10x more, 100x more compute for um, the practitioners, the people who are asking for this compute, the ML practitioners, they would happily consume it. What this graph shows is, over the past six years, the number of dense parameters for the largest models that have been reported uh, external. So this is a range of them, some of them from Google, some of them, uh, uh, many of them not. And year over year, the growth has been a factor of 10. So over a six-year period, that's a factor of a million in dense parameters. A factor of 1,000 we delivered over the past 20 years was pretty impressive. I, I mean, really shocking to deliver a factor of 1,000. But now you have a world in which probably the majority of your compute demand let's say for ML training and serving, is growing at uh, 10x a year, every year. Now juxtapose this with the previous slide that shows all the previous trends slowing and stopping, just at a time when the demand has never been larger. Um, it's um, either really, really scary or really exciting. For me, it's really exciting. Because uh, as they say, um, necessity is the parent of invention. It's not just a nice to have right now. It's a must have. We have to reinvent. We have to think about how to do things differently because how we've done them just isn't gonna work. And uh, that, that presents massive opportunity. Now, um, the overall point here is that the amount of compute grows super linearly with the number of dense parameters. And so worse than uh, linear, which means that we have to continue to um, keep up. So just a little bit of background. The vast majority of uh, for the ML community today focuses on these uh, dense models, uh, organized as layers. And essentially, every um, weight, every layer is touched to do training, every pass forward and backward. Uh, something is going to have to give. So in other words, no matter what, no matter how well we do, how, no, no matter how well you all do as a community, we're not going to be able to keep up with the fact of 10 growth year over year. Uh, so a lot of interesting work is being done at the application layer, and I dare say that most of the benefit will come at the application layer. So sparse models is just one example, where only subsets of the layers, perhaps, and certainly subsets of the parameters are 
uh, activated for training and for serving are coming, and they show substantial promise. Uh, this says different parts of the model are specialized for different kinds of inputs, uh, and you might just touch the right 1% or the right 10% uh, of the data uh, in response to queries. This also says that uh, architecture, uh, what we all do, has to evolve to keep up with this evolution. And that means we have to move fast and we have to be flexible in thinking about how we build our uh, infrastructure to support the ever-changing paradigm. So in other words, it's a, a continuous feedback loop. Unfortunately, of course, there can be substantial delays in building, deploying, designing, building, and deploying new hardware um, as we try to keep up with what the um, algorithm designers are seeing. They're saying, well, hardware is not going to keep up with my 10x demands on dense parameters. It has for some number of years, but no longer. So now I have to change. But then that says that the hardware has to change to keep up with it. OK, so with that background, what does it mean to build the most robust machine learning ecosystem um, around, uh, in the end, the models? Uh, I, I'll say that um, one of the things that's, uh, that we've benefited from quite a bit at Google is that we co-designed between the researchers uh, and, the, in the end, the hardware developers. So uh, at Google, um, perhaps one of the uh, most influential papers, I would say not just in machine learning, but period over the past decade, has been the Transformer paper. Uh, last I checked, I think it's been uh, cited over 100,000 times in a six-year period. This is the basis, um, as to uh, use another company as, a, as an example, the T in, in ChatGPT stands for Transformer. Essentially, all modern ML training and inference is based on this uh, technology and this research work, really, uh, that came out uh, six years ago. It's truly been a breakthrough. Now, how do we co-design our systems around the uh, models and algorithms that are coming? One example, and I think uh, we could have an uh, uh, equally compelling slide around uh, GPUs, is that for the first time, uh, specialized compute uh, makes sense and perhaps is the uh, only way forward to meet the rising demand of uh, computing across the industry. So uh, what this means, though, is that we have to break all the conventional wisdom and break all the sort of hard-won lessons that have come over the past 20, 30, 40 years. So at uh, Google, starting in about uh, 2015, when we deployed our first TPUs, uh, we have really focused on judicious specialization plus application co-design in building out our infrastructure. And as a result, taken together, we see that uh, TPUs today deliver somewhere between a factor of 10 to 100 improvement in performance, in power consumption, and in cost for carrying out our workloads, our machine learning workloads, relative to general purpose compute. And uh, while this is good, actually much more needs to be done. How we did this was essentially revisiting conventional wisdom across many different dimensions. I'll go through some of them now. Uh, we built a synchronous high bandwidth interconnect to support in hardware parameter distribution. And this uh, network is not an ethernet network. Right? So I mentioned the birth of ethernet in the early 70s, 50 years ago. Uh, it never made sense up until now to build a non-ethernet network to connect your computers together. But this is actually a very specialized, very simple network that supports the distribution from memory to memory of one TPU to another at speeds that uh, approach or surpass your highest uh, speed uh, switches, let's say uh, top of rack switches, et cetera. Uh, we support liquid cooling, which was a very controversial move because it was the only way we could get the right level of power efficiency. Right? All data centers uh, prior, and most data centers still today, are air-cooled. But uh, from the ground up, we built the hardware to support liquid cooling. Uh, we moved to specialized data representations. A uh, really nice talk from um, Bill Dolly that shows that actually much of the wins from specialized hardware has been around specialized the data representation. So we adopted not IEEE standard floating point, but everything from INT4 to BF16. We interconnect our TPUs together with optical circuit switches. So again, for the first time in 50 plus years, we moved away from electrical packet routing to optical circuit switches to connect these uh, TPUs together for uh, higher levels of performance, but as we'll see, as importantly, or perhaps more, for higher levels of reliability. Of course, we've had specialized hardware for dense matrix multiplication. Uh, we also have recently, 
uh, nearing the move to sparse models, then building specialized hardware for scatter gather operations and for pointer uh, chasing across a really distributed shared memory supercomputer uh, to support those scatter gather and uh, sparse operations as well. And finally, we moved from DRAM to high bandwidth memory, essentially co-locating the uh, DRAM stacks uh, with the compute dies for much higher bandwidth and lower latency to keep these uh, compute elements well fed. And there are papers, uh, ISCA, SICOM, and more that describe uh, the work in much more detail. I want to spend a second on uh, optical circuit switching uh, in the data center. So essentially, the way to look at TPUs is that um, individual racks of TPUs make up uh, four by four by four cubes, right? 64 TPUs in a rack that are connected in a uh, torus hypercube uh, topology. These racks are then interconnected uh, to one another into what uh, winds up being another four by four by four hypercube. Uh, all the way up to 4,096 TPUs, right, in this uh, supercomputer. What interconnects the racks together, the base 64 TPUs, is an optical circuit switch. What this means, uh, and so the technology behind optical circuit switches is uh, really interesting. Uh, at Google, I, I think it's fair to say we're the first to uh, make it uh, viable at scale. Um, the fibers connecting the TPUs together all come together into an array of uh, OCSs, optical circuit switches. Uh, they plug in just like they would into any switch, but essentially they um, have the light from these fibers shine down into a MEMS switch. You can see the picture on the right-hand side. This uh, switch would fit in the palm of my hand quite comfortably. Think of it as hundreds of beams of light that are shown down on mirrors, tiny mirrors, that are rotated with very small motors in 3D to precisely reflect light from an input port to an output port. So you have all the light shining down, and under software control, you can program these mirrors to reflect the, right, the light to the right output port. And what this says then is that you can take your 64 TPU base uh, hypercubes and connect them in arbitrary topologies. A hypercube has lots of benefits. It has downsides from a fault tolerance perspective. What the optical circuit switch allows you to do is reconfigure the hypercube in near real time, let's say seconds, to respond to any failures that might happen at scale. Uh, this is uh, tough technology to get right, tough technology to scale, right? and tough technology to manage. But it says that we actually didn't have a choice. And that was the uh, maybe beautiful and hard thing. We had to reinvent. And this is just one example of how that reinvention took place. Uh, the cost winds up being lower. The power consumption winds up being lower. The, one, the thing to think about is that these mirrors essentially consume close to zero energy in being held in place. Once you create a topology, you're not actually inspe inspecting bits. There's no electric work happening. Right? You have decided that this beam of light needs to go from this input port to that output port. And all you need to do is hold this tiny mirror in place to make sure that the reflection continues uh, in the direction that you want it to. So uh, while it was tough to build, it's been hugely beneficial in the end for system throughput, because the reliability of the infrastructure goes up dramatically. OK, so we've been at this at uh, Google, uh, as I mentioned, since uh, 2015. The original motivation for the work was doing uh, real-time inference for um, voice. Uh, we had some people do some nice calculation that said if every Google user back in 2014, let's say, uh, was to interact with Google via voice for 30 seconds a day, we would have to increase the size of Google by a factor of 10 to handle that workload, which would have been and is unaffordable even for that one workload back in 2014, about 10 years ago. So the first TPUs uh, supported that uh, use case. We generalized them to training with uh, the version 2. Version 3 came out a few years later, followed by uh, version 4, and we recently announced uh, the fifth generation of uh, TPUs as well. Okay, so uh, this is one step. It's not going to be enough, though. So uh, I would say that over the coming years, we're going to have to deliver another factor of 100 quite easily. A lot of the innovation will come from the uh, algorithm side, the model side, but we're also going to have to do a lot uh, from the system uh, hardware and software side. So what I'll be focusing on here, there's a lot of things we have to do. 
uh, continue figuring out how we scale out horizontally. Uh, the algorithmic innovation, which I think is going to uh, deliver actually most of the benefits. But independent of that, for this 100x on the system and hardware side, I'll talk about uh, optimizing for systems good put, power, reliability, and uh, carbon dioxide equivalents. And so what I'm going to discuss is that we actually need to shift our uh, metrics. I'm uh, continuously inspired uh, by uh, uh, Patterson and Hennessy. Uh, and uh, uh, we were talking last night about the, what for me was a formative textbook. But one of the um, things that I remember from that is, for better or worse, uh, benchmark shape an industry. Right? And uh, if you give great engineers, of which there are many here, of which there are many at uh, many companies, the right benchmarks, the right things happen. So what are the right benchmarks that we need to define? I, I believe we actually don't have them uh, to make sure that the community goes in the right direction in the years ahead. And so what I'd argue is that good put is a really important thing to focus on, power, reliability, and uh, carbon dioxide equivalents. Currently, um, and uh, there are some exceptions, hardware is evaluated in terms of chip performance per dollar within a fixed power budget. What this says is that uh, higher power is OK for a chip as long as it meets reliability and heat dissipation requirements. And if it can be air-cooled, again, traditionally speaking, within a fixed space. The problem here is that you wind up focusing on headline performance numbers. The maximum, let's say, floating point operations per second that a particular chip can carry out relative to the cost of that chip. Nowhere do you think about the good put or the reliability delivered to the system as a whole, um, the power efficiency of that uh, chip, how it scales out to a system, and the power cost associated with building that chip. So if you hear headline numbers uh, of the form, A, this generation of chip is twice the performance for the same cost, or maybe it's for 1.5x the cost as the last generation, that is, to me, not the right metric to be focusing on. Right? So it's oftentimes too uh, simplistic a view. We do have some nice benchmarks. Uh, some of you in the audience have uh, helped define them, and thank you very much for that. We use them internally and externally at Google, MLPerf. But a, even MLPerf reports absolute performance at a given system size. It doesn't uh, yet account for system cost, uh, carbon dioxide equivalents, or efficiency, with power being an optional reporting metric that uh, most people actually don't choose to focus on. At uh, Google, uh, all of our system design, uh, including going back to traditional servers, is uh, based on perf per TCO. So in other words, when we look at any hardware generation, we think of it in terms of the workload that, so the numerator here, perf, is workload performance. And it's not that of, and the TCO is system cost, all in. So one aspect to look at for TCO is we have it as the sum of CapEx plus OpEx, right? capital expenditure, how much you're paying for, yes, the chip, but then the main board, the sheet metal that goes around it, the rack that it gets housed in, uh, the network connectivity, the DRAM, the HBM, uh, the SSDs, the disks, et cetera, et cetera. The OpEx is uh, the power consumption over the lifetime of the device. Today, for most devices at most companies, that's uh, six years and the space and power provisioning. Right? You have to actually have some space. You have to have built some uh, power distribution to get that, uh, let's say, rack uh, placed in that space. So that's the denominator, total cost of ownership. And the numerator then, again, is around a uh, set of defined workloads for that system. Right? What's the performance that is um, uh, delivered in the end? Perf TCO, while it's been a nice advancement for us and has driven some nice work, also has uh, some hidden assumptions that I think we need to uh, revisit. We're in the process of revisiting them at Google, uh, but there are challenges with it. So one uh, assumption with Perf TCO is there's enough VC capacity to house new compute. And it's OK uh, to idle some of this, uh, so there's a typo here, some of the provision power capacity. So let's um, think about this. Essentially. The point here is that you always have the ability to build out more space and power to house your compute infrastructure. 
Think in terms of your cell phone. You have a fixed power budget over the course of the day, typically. You have to fit your compute within that power budget. You don't have the option of infinitely adding out more uh, uh, battery capacity to your cell phone. Another uh, challenge with ProTCO is that consumed power can be accurately attributed back to individual workloads. Given the multiplexing that we do and the scheduling of our workloads across the planet, it actually can be hard to know exactly what power a particular workload is consuming, especially when we schedule it across multiple generations of heterogeneous servers and TPUs and GPUs. Right, so what was the power bill for your workload? Well, it depends on where it ran and when it ran. And then finally, uh, the toughest one is that we assume that performance accurately captures the characteristics of both present and future workloads and accounts for reliability. The reliability portion has been less important for loosely coupled compute, which has been the paradigm for the past 20 years. When you're running a job potentially synchronously across 4,096 TPUs or GPUs and maybe scaling out from there, the uh, failure of a single element can be uh, substantially meaningful. So what I'm gonna argue here is that we have to be increasingly thinking in terms of systems performance per average watt, right, not for peak, and systems performance for carbon dioxide equivalents. Right? And carbon dioxide equivalents has to uh, account for DC construction, data center construction. It has to account for the um, build and delivery uh, of the compute, as well as the operational cost of the compute. So let me just uh, illustrate why this is meaningful, even if we try to reduce this to uh, just a dollar number. So from external estimates, the cost to build a server, right, just a single standard server, uh, is somewhere between one to four tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And again, from external uh, sources, the offsets required for one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent is $1,000. If you wanna be carbon neutral for a ton of carbon dioxide equivalents, it costs about $1,000 uh, based on external sources. Now, um, let's go through a what might be typical 1,000 watt ish server that runs at 50% average utilization over its six year lifetime. If you do the math in the typical data center, right, according to IE, the IEA, uh, that server will consume about 12 and a half metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent over its six-year lifetime. And if you were to multiply that by $1,000, that's $12,500 for the six-year lifetime of the server. Roughly equivalent, uh, de depends on the server configuration, et cetera, et cetera, but roughly equivalent to the cost of the server itself. Something that's not accounted for in the design of uh, calculus for most people and, and so this is substantial now of course if you are able to power it from clean energy sources which has uh, its own challenges and limitations that twelve thousand five hundred dollar cost perhaps or that 12.5 metric tons of co2 uh, it can go down by factor two it could go down to zero and that's again another consideration in terms of how we design and deploy our infrastructure okay so how are, uh, lots of different things come up and I think for, for time, um, I'll go through some of these uh, quickly. Uh, moving forward, I think substantial opportunities around ensuring that we're optimizing software and hardware to manage dynamic power consumption range for average power. And uh, this goes back to a um, very influential uh, paper at Google, and I think externally, um, on the case for energy proportional computing uh, that appeared uh, 16 years ago that said, server performance should be proportional to the amount of power that you put in. I think that uh, we have somewhat lost sight of that consideration, certainly in the age of accelerated computing. Right? So in other words, as, uh, this, and this is also what happens when we talk about maximum flops per chip, we lose sight of total delivered performance or good puts of a system. And so on the left hand uh, here, we have a very simple view, right, toy view of the training throughput that you might get as a function of the peak watts that you put in to the system. What you can see is that actually uh, more power is perhaps good at continuing to incrementally increase the training throughput, but it does tail off. And so you might get to a place where you decide actually 
I don't want more performance. I'd rather actually stop at 70% because that's where the linear portion of the curve stops. And in fact, I may want to run uh, multiple jobs over that same power ledger rather than try to run that one job as quickly as possible. Especially for training, it's a very interesting calculus because there isn't necessarily a human in the loop right, waiting for some uh, response to come back. Inference could be a separate question. And this then leads to the question of how do you provision the right number of watts so that you can actually get the most good put, throughput of your, of your jobs as shown on the right-hand graph. Some really uh, exciting, I think, opportunities at the hardware level. And one of the key things that I would uh, love to ask of this community is more telemetry to be able to uh, deliver real-time optimization of power according to cartoons like this. Right? So me, mostly a software person. I have an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, but I'm mostly a software person. I somewhat understand this uh, picture, but I, I find the um, opportunity to be, to be compelling. What this essentially shows here is two jobs, right, running uh, co-scheduled, let's say, on some infrastructure, where we have one job, job one is compute bound, but uh, job two in blue is memory bound. What this says is that actually the voltage and the current for job two, the memory bound uh, job, varies widely. Right? Whereas the compute bound one is more steady in terms of both its voltage and current cons uh, consumption. What you can do, and these are a flavor of the kinds of things that we are doing, is responding somewhat in real time to realize that actually I can run the uh, compute bound job at higher current perhaps reducing the current for the memory bound job. Steadying out, slowing down if you want, during the peak uh, compute demands of job two, slowing it down, but it's memory bound anyway. So the total performance of job two stays the same while I am able to free up power in the end for job one. So in aggregate, if I had access to real-time information where I could have software control loops actuating, I could deliver perhaps 10% more performance or 20% less power. These are early days, and so the opportunity here is substantial. With more telemetry, with finer grain telemetry, there are these uh, substantial improvements. And taken together, I think in terms of energy efficiency, power efficiency, there are integer factors of uh, opportunity for us that we can go after. Uh, jumping up one level, and I'll go through this uh, quickly, we actually are also able to think about how we do job placement and scheduling at the cluster level. So one thing to know about uh, clusters is that power is dis distributed essentially across uh, bus bars. Let's think of them as the rows, row after row after row of compute. Each has its own independent uh, power uh, distribution and maximum power load. Uh, a, a lot here in this picture that I won't have the time to go through, but what you can imagine is that uh, if you try to place your high power demand job all on a single bus bar, you'll act, you might actually run out of power depending on how you've uh, provisioned things. Whereas if you can do multiplexing such that you can stripe horizontally rather than vertically as shown in this picture, so that you can spread your highly demanding power jobs across multiple bus bars, you'll actually be able to admit more and get uh, much more throughput. And these wind up being quite meaningful uh, for our infrastructure. Um, Failures are a major, major issue uh, for us, and they're a major limiter in terms of how we're able to manage good put across the system. So again, for time, I'm not gonna go through uh, this example in as much detail as it uh, deserves, but imagine that I had a large 16 rack synchronous job and four one rack jobs running across four bus bars within my data center in the simple example. Now further, let's say that we have a power failure event which uh, we do, and it's not an uncommon occurrence. If we were to um, just deal with this normally, what would happen is we would lose one of those uh, single rack jobs, and maybe that's okay. But what this would then mean is that we uh, only have 40%, 60% um, of our power in that one bus bar. And this throttling would affect everything for the large 16 rack job. Right? So the three bus bars that are hosting the uh, other jobs would have to also be throttled back to run at the speed of the slowest racks. What you can imagine is that actually by re, 
uh, placing some of the jobs and being aware of what's happening across the cluster, we're able to, and you'll trust me on the math, get to a place where we can maximize throughput in the face of these power failure events by shifting things around to the right bus bars and the right moments. So we can wind up in a place where the entire job, rather than being throttled by 40%, is only throttled by 5%. And perhaps we can even boost the performance of the single rack jobs from additional power that was freed up in those two bus bars. We can shift compute across uh, space and time. And again, what you can imagine is that uh, there's a maximum amount of uh, zero carbon energy available in particular data centers. And we can take advantage of that to make sure that we dip into higher carbon emission energy sources only when absolutely critical, and ideally never, by shifting workloads around across time and space for these throughput sensitive jobs. Okay, um, I, I wanna spend uh, just a minute or, or less on this last point before wrapping up, and this is uh, silent data corruption, uh, which again, I think this is something that this community can help uh, a ton with. Uh, this is a problem that we first found in uh, CPUs. There's a hot OS paper that you can read about for the details, but essentially, um, periodically, and maybe with uh, too much frequency, uh, Four can say one plus one equals three. And it could be infant mortality, it could be aging, it could be a range of things, but the rate of incidence has been going up over time. This is a serious problem for CPUs. It's a much worse problem for uh, ML training because silent data corruption in a single, let's say, TPU or GPU can quickly spread with incorrect data distributed across thousands of GPUs or TPUs. So a failure, perhaps silently, of a single element can propagate incorrect results across thousands of elements. So uh, we detect this today by essentially looking at the gradients over time of what happens when we're uh, converging during training runs. And if we see an anomalous event with respect to a jump in the gradient over a training run, uh, what we're able to do is, so a little bit of background, because of the reliability of the infrastructure, the duration of training runs, could be days, weeks, or even months, we are constantly taking checkpoints of the state of the computation to allow us to restart from a failure. One of the leading causes of failure is this uh, silent data corruption. If we hit a case where we suspect the silent data corruption, what we're able to do is, uh, actually using our optical circuit switch, reconfigure the torus topology to isolate what we think is the bad elements, rotate in, hopefully known good hardware, and rerun that step. If that step shows the same characteristic, well, it wasn't an anomaly. If it shows different convergence properties, we now have a suspected source of silent data corruption that we can isolate. But this work required to, A, constantly be taking checkpoints, uh, isolating the issues, restarting, is a substantial hit to our good put. In other words, when you're talking about peak flops per chip, you're not talking about how much work you have to do to recover from failures of that hardware on a fairly regular basis. And so maybe you would take less peak flops per chip in exchange for a more reliable um, chip that requires much uh, less frequent checkpointing, uh, requires this isolation mechanism to happen less frequently, et cetera. Okay, so I'll skip the, um, the details. This picture shows how we're able to isolate uh, the issue that ho hopefully came across uh, clearly. Okay, so I wanted to leave a couple of minutes for questions, but um, hopefully what you've taken away from this presentation is that uh, we are in a uniquely exciting moment in terms of the demands on computing infrastructure, uh, and the way that we've gone about doing things is gonna have to not just evolve, but I think change radically. There are some really profound uh, opportunities and implications for the work that we're doing here. So really looking forward to the next few years. Thank you very much.
Yeah, so I think that uh, uh, the safety, one could uh, argue, is uh, uh, a key pithos here of this technology. And so I do want to uh, underscore that actually um, the responsibility part of the work is key across the board. So I, I do agree with you. I, I have no specific uh, comments other than appreciation in terms of what many across the community are doing to emphasize the safety and responsibility aspect of the technology. I do want to uh, also mention that uh, there's going to be a range of policies that we have to develop as a community. I think it's uh, while the policy definition perhaps isn't the work of micro or the work of systems, building the infrastructure that can flexibly adapt to a range of policies and enforce them is a technical problem. And again, building our uh, systems for uh, these requirements from the ground up is going to be really, really important moving forward. Yeah, uh, fantastic points, and that's a subject of a whole um, another uh, possible uh, presentation. But data is the uh, next frontier in terms of super challenging problems in um, in ML. The quality of the models is dependent on uh, the quality of the data. So one could argue that this moment that we have with um, our, uh, generative AI really is driven by what I was observing earlier, that you have the totality of human knowledge available to you for training these models. That might change. And in fact, what we're seeing is that actually uh, many publishers uh, aren't necessarily making their data uh, available moving forward. Uh, so I think that having the uh, right incentives for data availability but also knowing, um, also from a responsibility perspective, uh, what data to train on, what data to serve is a substantial challenge. Uh, I, I do think that with co compute, uh, massive opportunity, but with data management, data provenance, um, data lineage, data security, that's going to, and quality, as you point out, and how we manage that uh, is absolutely going to be the next um, frontier here. I will point out that actually a lot of the generative AI breakthroughs are driven by uh, humans in the loop in generating and evaluating the data beyond what might be available from, let's say, an internet um, crawl, et cetera. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned, the regulatory environment is going to be absolutely uh, critical here at, um, at Google. This is something that we've been discussing for uh, a number of years. In other words, our, our position, and uh, I can uh, say is we've, we've had a lot of uh, careful uh, debate in terms of how quickly we move with uh, this uh, technology. I do think that actually the government um, governments are going to have a very substantial role to play here. Um, what you can see is that actually many of the technical companies are uh, stepping up. Uh, for example, Google and others made a number of commitments to uh, the White House uh, from, from the U.S. perspective. Uh, as of now, um, we are self-policing uh, to a large extent. But I think, and we, we heard about OpenAI and uh, some of the nice work that they're doing, uh, Anthropic, uh, others who are doing some Google, some nice work here. I, I do think that actually the regulatory environment is going to have to evolve and move rapidly. And again, from my perspective, I really want to take it as a technical opportunity to make sure that we can respond to the regulatory requirements quickly. One of the things that we're seeing is that too often it can take two, three, four, five years um, to respond to new regulatory requirements. I don't think that we can afford to be uh, moving at that pace uh, today.
Yeah, so for our TPUs, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. As I mentioned, uh, uh, currently, and uh, you'll be hearing more, we scale to about 4,096 uh, TPUs. Each TPU has uh, about four terabits per second of network bandwidth, and this is non-Ethernet uh, connectivity. So four terabits, quite a bit of uh, bandwidth, and it does, now the bisection bandwidth is in four terabits per second for chip in the Taurus topology, but for uh, stochastic gradient descent and the communication patterns that take place for training, uh, the, the bandwidth is substantial. So we are able to scale to rather large computations, I would say uh, some of the largest on the planet. We do go beyond 4096, and this is where some of these um, more sparse models and the mixture of experts uh, style of work comes into play, where you're right, the amount of bandwidth per server that houses some number of TPUs or GPUs, could be four, could be eight, is much more limited. Uh, and in, in those cases, you have to then make sure that your algorithms and your models are adapting to the available communication patterns. That makes the job of the model designer more challenging. So to a particular scale, uh, let's say thousands, uh, things are quite good, I would say. Beyond that, different uh, type of work needs to be done to support the scaling. Um, I'm excited, so um, I, I sleep really well, I, I think. Um, so it's, to me, honestly, this does, I'm, I am easily excited perhaps, but this does feel like the um, uh, early days of the internet uh, revolution. So, uh, and for me, uh, and like many of you, many of you probably come up with uh, amazing new ideas. But then one of the w ways that I found that amazing new ideas fail is not because the idea is not great, it's because it's not absolutely necessary to adopt that idea. In other words, okay, well, the way that we're doing things is good enough. So why would I want to go through the pain of adopting your great new idea? Like, I'm comfortable, why bother? I, I, and that always upset me. Today, we really need a lot of great ideas. Like, in other words, the way that we've done things is not good enough. And that, that I hope, is a takeaway. In other words, to me, it's actually not a scary moment, it's an exciting moment that across the board we need breakthroughs. And uh, we desperately need breakthroughs. So the bold new ideas, the, hey, let's do things completely differently because it can be a factor of five or 10 better, we can't ignore those things today. So I actually think of it as, wow, what an exciting time. Not, not scary in that sense. Thank you.